Now dawn the yellow-robed, scattered over all the earth. Zeus, who joys in the thunder, made an assembly of all the immortals upon the highest peak of rugged Olympus. There he spoke to them himself, and the other divinities listened. Hear me, all you gods and all you goddesses. Hear me while I speak forth what the heart within my breast urges. Now let no female divinity, nor male god either, presume to cut across the way of my word, but consent to it, all of you, so that I can make an end in speed of these matters. And anyone I perceive against the gods' will attempting to go among the Trojans and help them, or among the Danaans, he shall go, whipped against his dignity, back to Olympus. Or I shall take him and dash him down to the murk of Tartarus, far below where the uttermost depth of the pit lies, under earth, where there are gates of iron and a brazen doorstone, as far beneath the house of Hades as from earth the sky lies. Then he will see how far I am, strongest of all the immortals. Come, you gods, make this endeavor, that you all may learn this. Let down out of the sky a cord of gold. Lay hold of it, all you who are gods and all who are goddesses, yet not even so can you drag down Zeus from the sky to the ground. Not Zeus, the High Lord of Council, though you try until you grow weary. Yet whenever I might strongly be minded to pull you, I could drag you up, earth and all, and sea, and all with you. Then fetch the golden rope about the horn of Olympus, and make it fast, so that all, once more, should dangle in midair. So much stronger am I than the gods, and stronger than mortals. So, he spoke, and all of them stayed stricken to silence, stunned at his word, for indeed he had spoken to them very strongly. But now, at long last, the goddess grey-eyed Athena answered him, Son of Cronos, our father, O lordliest of the mighty, we know already your strength, and how none can stand up against it. Yet even so, we are sorrowful, for the Danaan spearmen, who must fill out an unhappy destiny and perish. Still, we shall keep out of the fighting as you command us. Yet we will put good counsel in the archives, if it may help them, so that not all of them will die because of your anger. Then Zeus, the gatherer of the clouds, smiled at her and answered, Tritogeneia. Dear daughter, do not lose heart, for I say this not in outright anger, and my meaning toward you is kindly. He spoke, and under the chariot harnessed his bronze-shod horses, flying-footed with long manes streaming of gold, and he put on clothing of gold about his own body, and took up the golden lash, carefully compacted, and climbed up into his chariot, and whipped them into a run, and they winged their way unreluctant through the space between the earth and the starry heaven. He came to Ida with all her springs, the mother of wild beasts, to Gargaron, where was his holy ground and his smoking altar. There the father of gods and of mortals halted his horses and slipped them from their harness and drifted close mist about them. And himself rejoicing in the pride of his strength sat down on the mountain looking out over the city of Troy and the ships of the Achaeans. Now the flowing-haired Achaeans had taken their dinner lightly among their shelters, and they put on their armor thereafter. And on the other side in the city, the Trojans took up their armor, fewer men yet minded to stand the encounter even so, caught in necessity for their wives and their children. And all the gates were made open, and the fighting men swept through them, the foot ranks and the horsemen, and the sound grew huge of their onset. Now as these advancing came to one place and encountered, they dashed their shields together and their spears, and the strength of armored men in bronze, and the shields massive in the middle clashed against each other. 
and the sound grew huge of the fighting. There the screaming and the shouts of triumph rose up together, of men killing and men killed, and the ground ran blood. So long as it was early morning and the sacred daylight increasing, so long the thrown weapons of both took hold and men dropped under them. But when the sun god stood bestriding the middle heaven, then the father balanced his golden scales, and in them he set two fateful portions of death, which lays men prostrate for Trojans, breakers of horses, and bronze-armored Achaeans, and balanced it by the middle. The Achaeans' death day was heaviest. There the fates of the Achaeans settled down toward the bountiful earth, while those of the Trojans were lifted into the wide sky, and he himself crashed a great stroke from either. A kindling flash shot over the people of the Achaeans. Seeing it, they were stunned and pale terror took hold of all of them. Then Idomeneus dared not stand his ground, nor Agamemnon, nor did the two Iantes stand, the henchmen of Ares. Only Geranian Nestor stayed, the Achaeans' watcher. Not that he would, but his horse was failing, struck by an arrow from brilliant Alexandros, the lord of lovely-haired Helen, struck at the point of the head where the utmost hairs of horses are grown along the skull, and which is a place most mortal. He reared up in agony as the shaft went into the brain, then through the team into confusion, writhing upon the bronze point. Now as the old man hewed away the horse's trace harness with the quick sword cut, meanwhile the fast-running horses of Hector came through the flux of the fighting and carried their daring driver, Hector, and now the old man would have lost his life there had not. Diomedes of the great war cry sharply perceived him. He cried out in a terrible voice to rally Odysseus. Son of Laertes and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, where are you running, turning your back in battle like a coward? Do not let them strike the spear in your back as you run for it, but stay so that we can beat back this fierce man from the ancient. He spoke, but long-suffering great Odysseus gave no attention as he swept by on his way to the hollow ships of the Achaeans. The son of Tydeus, alone as he was, went among the champions and stood before the horses of the old man, the son of Neleus, and uttering his winged words, he addressed him, Old sir, in very truth, these young fighters are too much for you, and all your strength is gone, and hard old age is upon you. Your henchman is a man of no worth, and your horses are heavy. Come then, climb into my chariot, so that you may see what the Trojan horses are like, how they understand their plane, and how to traverse it in rapid pursuit and withdrawal. Horses I took away from Aeneas, who strikes men to terror. Let the henchmen look after your horses now, while we too steer these against the Trojans, breakers of horses, so Hector even may know if my spear also rages in my hand's grip. He spoke, and Nestor, the Geranian horseman, obeyed him. Thereon the two strong henchmen, Stenelos and the courtly Eurymedon, looked after the horses of Nestor. The others both together mounted the chariot of Diomedes. Nestor, in his hands, took up the glittering reins, then lashed the horses on, and soon they were close to Hector. And as he raged straight forward, the son of Tydeus threw at him and missed his man, but struck the charioteer, his henchman, Eniopeus, the son of high-hearted Thebaios, striking him in the chest next to the nipple as he gripped the reins of his horses. He fell out of the chariot and the fast-footed horses shied away, and there his life and his strength were scattered. And bitter sorrow closed over Hector's heart for his driver, yet grieving as he did for his friend, he left him to lie there and went on after another bold charioteer. And it was not long that the horses went lacking a driver, since soon he found one, Archeptolemos, bold son of Iphitos, and gave into his hands the reins, 
and mounted him behind the fast running horses. And now there would have been fighting beyond control and destruction. Now they would have been driven and penned like sheep against Ilion, had not the father of gods and of men sharply perceived them. He thundered horribly and let loose the shimmering lightning and dashed it to the ground in front of the horses of Diomedes and a ghastly blaze of flaming sulfur shot up and the horses terrified both cringed away against the chariot. And the glittering reins escaped out of the hands of Nestor and he was afraid in his heart and called out to Diomedes, son of Tydeus, steer now to flight your single foot horses. Can you not see that the power of Zeus no longer is with you? For the time Zeus, son of Kronos, gives glory to this man for today. Hereafter, if he will, he will give it to us also. No man can beat back the purpose of Zeus, not even one very strong, since Zeus is by far the greater. Then in turn, Diomedes of the great war cry answered, Yes, old sir, all this you have said is fair and orderly. But this thought comes as a bitter sorrow to my heart and my spirit. For some day, Hector will say openly before the Trojans, the son of Tydeus, running before me, fled to his vessels. So he will vaunt and then let the wide earth open beneath me. Nestor, the Geranian horseman, spoke to him in answer. Ah, me, son of brave Tydeus, what a thing to have spoken. If Hector calls you a coward and a man of no strength, then the Trojans and Dardanians will never believe him, nor will the wives of the high-hearted Trojan warriors, they whose husbands you hurled in the dust in the pride of their manhood. So he spoke and turned to flight the single-foot horses back again into the rout. And now the Trojans and Hector, with unearthly clamor, showered their baneful missiles upon them. And tall Hector of the shining helm called out in a great voice, Son of Tydeus, beyond others the fast-mounted in our arms honored you with pride of place, the choice meats and the filled wine cups, but now they will disgrace you who are no better than a woman. Down with you, you poor doll. You shall not storm our battlements with me giving way before you. You shall not carry our women home in your ships. Before that comes, I will give you your destiny. He spoke, and the son of Tydeus pondered doubtfully whether to turn his horses about and match his strength against Hector. Three times in his heart and spirit he pondered, turning and three times from the hills of Ida, Zeus of the councils thundered, giving a sign to the Trojans that the battle was turning. But Hector called afar in a great voice to the Trojans. Trojans, Lycians and Dardanians who fight at close quarters, be men now, dear friends. Remember your furious valor. I see that the son of Kronos has bowed his head and assented to my high glory and success. But granted that in our arms disaster, fools who designed with care these fortifications, flimsy things, not worth a thought, which will not beat my strength back, but likely my horses will leap the ditch they have dug them. But after I have come beside their hollow ships, let there be some who will remember to bring me ravening fire so that I can set their ships on fire and cut down the very Argives, mazed in the smoke at the side of their vessels. So he spoke and called aloud to his horses and spoke to them. Xanthos and you, Podargos, Aethon and Lampos the Shining now repay me for all that loving care and abundance Andromache, the daughter of high-hearted Aetion, gave you the sweet-hearted wheat before all the others and mixed wine with it for you to drink when her heart inclined to it. As for me, who am proud that I am her young husband, follow close now and be rapid so we may capture the shield of Nestor, whose high fame goes up to the sky. Now, how oh, it is all of gold, the shield itself and the cross rods and strip from the shoulders of Diomedes, breaker of horses, that elaborate corslet that Hephaestus wrought with much toil. Could we capture these two things? I might hope the Achaeans might embark this very night on their fast-running vessels. So he spoke 
boasting, and the Lady Hera was angry and started upon her throne, and tall Olympus was shaken, and she spoke straight out to the great god Poseidon. For shame now, far powerful shaker of the earth, in your breast the heart takes no sorrow for the Danaans who are dying. They who at Helike and at Aigai bring you offerings numerous and delightful. Do you then plan that they conquer? For if all of us who stand by the Danaans only were willing to hurl back the Trojans and hold off Zeus of the broad brows, he would be desperate. There where he sits by himself on Ida. Deeply troubled, the powerful shaker of the earth answered her, Hera, reckless of word, what sort of thing have you spoken? I would not be willing that all the rest of us fight with Zeus, the son of Kronos, since he is so much greater. Now, as these two were talking thus to each other, meanwhile, for those others, all that space which the ditch of the wall held off from the ships was filled with armored men and with horses penned there, and he who penned them was a man like the rapid war god, Hector Priam's son. Since Zeus was giving him glory. And now he might have kindled their balanced ships with the hot flame, had not the Lady Hera set it in Agamemnon's heart to rush in with speed himself and stir the Achaeans. He went on his way beside the Achaeans' ships and their shelters, holding up in his heavy hand the great colored mantle, and stood beside the black, huge, hollowed ship of Odysseus, which lay in the midmost so that he could call out to both sides, either toward the shelters of Telamon and Ias, or toward Achilles, since these two had drawn their balanced ships up at the utter ends, sure of the strength of their hands and their courage. He lifted his voice and called in a piercing cry to the Danaans, Shame you Argives, poor non-entities, splendid to look on. Where are our high words gone? When we said that we were the bravest, those words you spoke before all in hollow vaunting at Lemnos when you were filled with abundant meat of the high horned oxen and drank from the great bowls filled to the brim with wine how each man could stand up against a hundred or even two hundred Trojans in the fighting. Now we together cannot match one of them, Hector who must presently kindle our ships with hot fire. Father Zeus, is it one of our two strong kings you have stricken in this disaster now and stripped him of his high honor? For I say that never did I pass by your fair wrought altar in my bent ships when I came here on this desperate journey. But on all altars I burned the fat and the thighs of oxen in my desire to sack the strong walled city of the Trojans. Still, Zeus, bring to pass at least this thing that I pray for let our men at least get clear and escape, and let not the Achaeans be thus beaten down at the hands of the Trojans. He spoke thus, and as he wept, the father took pity upon him and bent his head, that the people should stay alive and not perish. Straightway he sent down the most lordly of birds, an eagle, with the fawn, the young of the running deer, caught in his talons, who cast down the fawn beside Zeus's splendid altar, where the Achaeans wrought their devotions to Zeus of the voices. They, when they saw the bird and knew it was Zeus who sent it, remembered once again their warcraft and turned on the Trojans. Then many as the Danaans were, there was no man among them could claim he held his fast horses ahead of the son of Tydeus to drive them once more across the ditch and fight at close quarters. But he was far the first to kill a chief man of the Trojans, Fradmon's son, Agelaos, as he turned his team to escape him. For in his back, even as he was turning, the spear fixed between the shoulders and was driven on through the chest beyond it he fell from the chariot, and his armor clattered upon him. After him came the Atreidae, Menelaos and Agamemnon, and the two Iantes gathering their fierce strength about them, and with them Idomeneus, and Idomeneus' companion Meriones, the match for the murderous lord of battles, and after these Eurypylos, the glorious son of Euaemon, and ninth came Telcros, 
bending into position the curved bow, and took his place in the shelter of Telamonion Ayas shield, and Ayas lifted the shield to take him. The hero would watch whenever in the throng he had struck some man with an arrow, and as the man dropped and died where he was stricken, the archer would run back again, like a child to the arms of his mother, to Ayas, who would hide him in the glittering shield's protection. Then which of the Trojans first did Teucros the Blameless strike down? Orsilochos first of all, and Ormenos, and Ophelestes, Dytor, and Chromaos, and Leucophontes the godlike, and Amopaeon, Poluimon's son, and Melanippos. All these he felled to the bountiful earth in close succession. Agamemnon, the lord of men, was glad as he watched him, laying waste from the strong bow the Trojan battalions. He went over and stood beside him and spoke a word to him. Telamonian Teucros, dear heart, O lord of your people, strike so, thus you may be a light given to the Danaans and to Telamon, your father, who cherished you when you were little, and, bastard as you were, looked after you in his own house. Bring him into glory, though he is far away. And for my part, I will tell you this, and it will be a thing accomplished. If ever Zeus who holds the Aegis and Athena grant me to sack outright the strong-founded citadel of Ilion, first after myself I will put into your hands some great gift of honor, a tripod, or two horses, and the chariot with them, or else a woman who will go up into the same bed with you. Then in answer to him again, spoke Teucros the Blameless. Son of Atreus, most lordly, must you then drive me who am eager myself as it is? Never, so far as the strength is in me, have I stopped since we began driving the Trojans back upon Ilion. Since then I have been lurking here with my bow to strike down fighters. And by this I have shot eight long flanged arrows and all of them were driven into the bodies of young men, fighters. Yet still I am not able to hit this mad dog. He spoke and let fly another shaft from the bowstring straight for Hector, and all his heart was straining to hit him, but missed his man, and struck down instead a strong son of Priam, Gorgithion the Blameless, hit in the chest by an arrow. Gorgithion, whose mother was lovely Castianera, Priam's bride from Isume, with the form of a goddess, he bent, drooping his head to one side as a garden poppy, bends beneath the weight of its yield and the rains of springtime, so his head bent slack to one side beneath the helm's weight. But Telcross now let fly another shaft from the bowstring, straight for Hector, and all his heart was straining to hit him, yet missed his man once again, as Apollo faltered his arrow and struck Archeptolemos, bold charioteer of Hector, in the chest next to the nipple as he charged into the fighting. He fell out of the chariot and the fast-footed horses shied away, and there his life and his strength were scattered. And bitter sorrow closed over Hector's heart for his driver. Yet grieving as he did for his friend, he left him to lie there and called to his brother, Cebriones, who stood near to take up the reins of the horses, nor did he disobey him. But Hector himself vaulted down to the ground from the shining chariot, crying a terrible cry, and in his hand caught up a great stone and went straight for Telcros, heart urgent to hit him. Now, Telcros had drawn a bitter arrow out of his quiver and laid it along the bowstring, but as he drew the shaft by his shoulder, there where between neck and chest the collarbone interposes, and this is a spot most mortal, in this place, shining-helmed Hector struck him in all his fury with the jagged boulder, smashing the sinew, and all his arm at the wrist was deadened. He dropped to one knee and stayed, and the bow fell from his hand. Ayas was not forgetful of his fallen brother, but running stood bestriding him and covered him under the great shield. Thereon Mecestius, son of Echios, 
and brilliant Alastor, two staunch companions, stooping beneath it, caught up Telcross and carried him, groaning heavily, to the hollow vessels. Now once again the Olympian filled the Trojans with fury, and they piled the Achaeans straight backward against the deep ditch, as Hector ranged in their foremost ranks in the pride of his great strength. As when some hunting hound in the speed of his feet, pursuing a wild boar or a lion, snaps from behind at his quarters or flanks, but watches for the beast to turn upon him so Hector followed close on the heels of the flowing-haired Achaeans, killing ever the last of the men, and they fled in terror. But after they had crossed back over the ditch and the sharp stakes in flight, and many had gone down under the hands of the Trojans, they reined in and stood fast again beside their ships, calling aloud upon each other, and to all of the gods uplifting their hands, each man of them cried out his prayers in a great voice, while Hector, wearing the stark eyes of a Gorgon, or murderous Ares, wheeled about at the edge his bright-maned horses. Now, seeing them, the goddess of the white arms, Hera, took pity, and immediately she spoke to Pallas Athena her winged words. For shame, daughter of Zeus, who wears the Aegis, no longer shall we care for the Danaans in their uttermost hour of destruction. These must then fill out an evil destiny and perish in the wind of one man's fury, where none can stand now against him. Hector, Priam's son, who has wrought so much evil already. Then in turn, the goddess gray-eyed Athena answered her, Yet even this man would have his life and strength taken from him, dying under the hands of the Argives in his own country. But it is my father who is so furious in his heart of evil. He is hard and forever wicked. He crosses my high hopes. Nor remembers it all those many times. I rescued his own son, Heracles, when the tasks of Eurystheus were too much for his strength. And time and again, he would cry out aloud to the heavens. Zeus would send me down in speed from the sky to help him. If in the wiliness of my heart I had had thoughts like his, when Heracles was sent down to Hades of the gates to hail back from the kingdom of the dark, the hound of the grisly death god, never would he have got clear of the steep dripping sticky in water. Yet now, Zeus hates me and is bent to the wishes of Thetis, who kissed his knees and stroked his chin in her hand and entreated that he give honor to Achilles, the sacker of cities. Yet time shall be when he calls me again, his dear girl, of the gray eyes. So then, do you put under their harness our single foot horses, while I go back into the house of Zeus, the lord of the Aegis, and arm me in my weapons of war? So shall I discover whether the son of Priam, Hector of the Shining Helmet, will feel joy to see us, apparent on the outworks of battle. Or see if some Trojan give the dogs and the birds their desire, with fat and flesh struck down beside the ships of the Achaeans. She spoke, nor failed to persuade the goddess Hera of the white arms. And she, Hera, exalted goddess, daughter of Kronos the mighty, went away to harness the gold bridled horses. Now, in turn, Athena, daughter of Zeus of the Aegis, beside the threshold of her father, slipped off her elaborate dress, which she herself had wrought with her hands, patience, and now, assuming the war tunic of Zeus who gathers the clouds, she armed herself in her gear for the dismal fighting. She set her feet in the blazing chariot and took up a spear, heavy, huge, thick wherewith she beats down the battalions of fighting men 
against whom she of the mighty father is angered. Hera laid the lash swiftly on the horses, and moving of themselves, groaned the gates of the sky that the hours guarded. Those hours to whose charge is given the huge sky and Olympus to open up the dense darkness, or again to close it. Through the way between they held the speed of their goaded horses, but Zeus' father watching from Ida was angered terribly and stirred Iris of the golden wings to run with his message. Go forth, Iris the swift. Turn them back again. Let them not reach me. Since we would close in fighting, thus that would be unseemly, I will say this straight out, and it will be a thing accomplished. I will lame beneath the harness the fast-running horses, and hurl the gods from the driver's place, and smash their chariot. And not in the circle of ten returning years shall they be whole of the wounds where the stroke of the lightning hits them so that the gray-eyed goddess may know when it is her father she fights with. Yet with Hera I am not so angry, neither indignant, since it is ever her way to cross the commands that I give her. He spoke, and Iris, storm-footed, rose with his message and took her way from the peaks of Ida to tall Olympus, and at the utmost gates of many folded Olympus met and stayed them and spoke the word that Zeus had given her. Where so furious? How can your hearts so storm within you? The son of Kronos will not let you stand by the Argives. Since Zeus has uttered this threat and will make it a thing accomplished, that he will lame beneath the harness your fast-running horses and hurl yourselves from the driver's place and smash your chariot. And not in the circle of ten returning years would you be whole of the wounds where the stroke of the lightning hits you, so that you may know, gray-eyed goddess, when it is your father you fight with. Yes, you. Bold, brazen wench, are audacious indeed if truly you dare to lift up your gigantic spear in the face of your father. Yet with Hera he is not so angry, neither indignant, since it is ever her way to cross the commands he gives her. So Iris the swift-footed spoke and went away from them. And now Hera spoke a word to Pallas Athena. Alas, daughter of Zeus, of the ages, I can no longer let us fight in the face of Zeus for the sake of mortals. Let one of them perish then, let another live as their fortune wills. Let him, as is his right, and as his heart pleases, work out whatever decrees he will on the Nods and Trojans. So she spoke, and turned back again her single-foot horses, and the hours set free. Their flowing mane says from the harness and tethered them at their mangers that were piled with ambrosia and leaned the chariot against the shining inward wall. Meanwhile, the goddesses themselves took their place on the golden couches among the other immortals, their hearts deep grieving within them. Now Father Zeus steered back from Ida his strong-wheeled chariot and horses to Olympus, and came among the gods' sessions, while for him famed Shaker of the Earth set free his horses and put the chariot on its stand with a cloth spread over it. Then Zeus himself of the wide brows took his place on the golden throne, as underneath his feet tall Olympus was shaken. These two alone Hera and Athena stayed seated apart aside.
from Zeus and would not speak to him nor ask him a question. But he knew the whole matter within his heart and spoke to them. Why then are you too sorrowful, Athena and Hera? Surely in the battle where men went glory, you were not wearied out, destroying those Trojans on whom you have set your grim wrath. In the whole account, such is my strength and my hand so invincible, not all the gods who are on Olympus could turn me backward. But before this, the trembling took hold of your shining bodies. Before you could look upon the fighting and war's work of sorrow. For I will say straight out, and it would now be a thing accomplished. Once hit in your car by the lightning stroke, you could never have come back to Olympus. Where is the place of the immortals? So he spoke. And Athena and Hera muttered, since they were sitting close to each other, devising evil for the Trojans. Still Athena stayed silent and said nothing, but only sulked at Zeus, her father, and savage anger took hold of her. But the heart of Hera could not contain her anger, and she spoke forth, Majesty, son of Kronos, what sort of thing have you spoken? We know well already your strength, how it is no small thing. Yet even so, we are sorrowful for the Danaan spearmen who must fill out an unhappy destiny and perish. Still we shall keep out of the fighting as you command us. Yet we will put good counsel in the archives if it may help them so that not all of them will die because of your anger. Zeus, who gathers the clouds, spoke to her again in answer. Tomorrow, at the dawning, Lady Hera of the Ox Eyes, you will see, if you have the heart, a still mightier son of Kronos perishing the range of numbers of the Argive spearmen. For Hector the Huge will not sooner be stayed from his fighting, until there stirs by the ships the swift-footed son of Peleus. On that day, when they shall fight by the sterns of the beached ships in the narrow place of necessity, over fallen. But Trump Trump's. This is the way. It is fated to be. And for you and your anger, I care not. Not if you stray apart to the undermost limits of earth and sea, where Iapetos and Kronos seated have no shining of the sun god Hyperion to delight them. No wings delight, but Tartarus stands deeply about them. Not even if you reach that place in your wandering shall I care for your sulks, since there is nothing more shameless than you are. So he spoke, and Hera of the White Arms gave him no answer. And now the shining light of the sun was dipped in the ocean, trailing black night across the grain-giving land. For the Trojans the daylight sank against their will, but for the Achaeans sweet and thrice supplicated was the coming on of the dark night. Now glorious Hector held an assembly of all the Trojans, taking them aside from the ships by a swirling river on clean ground where there showed a space not cumbered with corpses. They stepped to the ground from behind their horses and listened to Hector, the loved of Zeus and the words he spoke to them. He in his hand held the eleven cubit long spear whose shaft was tipped with the shining bronze spearhead and a ring of gold was hooped to hold it. Leaning upon this spear, he spoke his words to the Trojans. Trojans and Dardanians and companions in arms, hear me. Now I had thought that destroying the ships and all the Achaeans, we might take our way back once more to windy Ilion, but the darkness came too soon. 
and this beyond all else rescued the Argives and their vessels along the beach where the sea breaks. But now let us give way to Black Knight's persuasion. Let us make ready our evening meal. And as for your flowing maned horses, set them free from their harness and cast down fodder before them. And lead forth also out of the city oxen and fat sheep in all speed. And convey out also the kindly sweet wine with food out of our houses and heap many piles of firewood so that all night long and until the young dawn appears we may burn many fires and the glare go up into heaven so that not in the night time the flowing haired Achaeans may set out to run for home over the sea's wide ridges no, not thus in their own good time must they take to their vessels, but in such a way that a man of them at home will still nurse his wound, the place where he has been hit with an arrow or sharp spear springing to his ship, so that another may shrink hereafter from bringing down fearful war on the Trojans, breakers of horses. And let the herald Zeus loves give orders about the city for the boys who are in their first youth and the grey-browed elders to take stations on the god-founded bastions that circle the city. And as for the women, have our wives, each one in her own house, kindle a great fire. Let there be a watch kept steadily, lest a sudden attack get into the town when the fighters have left it. Let it be thus, high-hearted men of Troy, as I tell you. Let that word that has been spoken now be a strong one with that which I speak at dawn to the Trojans, breakers of horses. For in good hope, I pray to Zeus and the other immortals that we may drive from our place these dogs swept into destruction whom the spirits of death have carried here on their black ships. Now for the night we shall keep watch on ourselves. And tomorrow, early, before dawn shows, shall arm ourselves in our weapons and beside their hollow vessels waken the bitter war god. And I shall know if the son of Tydeus, strong Diomedes, will force me back from the ships against the wall, or whether I shall cut him down with the bronze and take home the blooded war spoils. Tomorrow he will learn his own strength. If he can stand up to my spears, advance. But sooner than this, I think in the foremost, he will go down under the stroke and many companions about him as the sun goes up into tomorrow. Oh, if only I could be as this in all my days, immortal and ageless, and be held in honor as Athena and Apollo are honored, as surely as this oncoming day brings evil to the Argives. So Hector spoke among them, and the Trojans shouted approval, and they set free their sweating horses from under the harness, and tethered them by the reins, each one by his own chariot. They led forth also out of the city oxen and fat sheep in all speed, and conveyed out also the kindly sweet wine with food out of their houses, and heaped many piles of firewood. They accomplished likewise full sacrifices before the immortals, and the winds wafted the sailor aloft from the plain to the heavens in its fragrance and yet the blessed gods took no part of it they would not so hateful to them was sacred living. and priam banned the city of priam on the strong So with hearts made high, these sat night long by the outworks of battle, and their watchfires blazed numerous about them, as when in the sky the stars about the moon's shining are seen in all their glory, when the air 
has fallen to stillness. And all the high places of the hills are clear, and the shoulders out jutting, and the deep ravines as endless bright air spills from the heavens. And all the stars are seen to make glad the heart of the shepherd. Such in their numbers blazed the watchfires the Trojans were burning between the waters of Xanthos and the ships before Ilion. A thousand fires were burning there in the plain, and beside each one sat fifty men in the flare of the blazing firelight. And standing, each beside his chariot, champing white barley and oats, the horses waited for the dawn to mount her high place. And the book eight.